what I want to do is be a little provocative. I want to give you some information that you may or may not know. And uh, for those of you who are osteopathic physicians, maybe some information that you don't even know. So I'm going to move right ahead since uh, my time is limited. And I want you to look at this slide, human self-regulation and health maintenance. The osteopathic profession is, uh, is very important to the United States. If you look at an area, and I was sitting across from uh, some, um, let's say, heads of the House of Representatives recently, and I dropped a, uh, a map, and the map had many pieces of information on it. And what it showed was the socioeconomics of that area, it showed the demographics of that area, what kind of physicians were in those areas, what kind of health care they received in those areas. And what was interesting was, was that there were seven osteopathic medical schools in that particular area supplying primary care physicians to that area. And the change in the demographics since those schools started was astounding in the quality of care that those people were receiving. These are the tenets of osteopathic medicine. And they should ring true to you. The body is a unit and the person represents a combination of the body, mind, and spirit. The body is capable of self-regulation, self-healing, and health maintenance. Structure and function are reciprocally interrelated. And then the fourth one is rational treatment is based on the understanding of the previous three. The principles, as stated here in this New York Times article, said, scorn no more, osteopathy is on the rise. Well, it's interesting because right now there are 26 schools with 34 campuses across the United States, 78,000 practicing DOs, 20,000 students. One in five students graduating from a medical school in the United States will be DOs in approximately three more years. What I want to do is give you a brief overview of some of the articles that have been published over many, many decades. Because one of the things people think about with the term osteopathic is manipulation related typically to the spine. And that's true. And definitely we've been very successful with that. As a matter of fact, this was a New England Journal article in 99 by Gunnar Anderson who is one of the heads now of the Bone and Joint initi Initiative. <clears throat> They've gone past the Bone and Joint decade, so they had to rename it because it's already been 11 years. <clears throat> and the conclusion was that they had similar clinical results as standard medical care, and that the use of medication was greater with standard, of care, standard care. That's his interpretation of the data. It's been reinterpreted multiple times, and it kind of was a little more favorable than what this says. But I'll leave it at that. And one of the reasons I'll leave it at that is because the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality took the American Osteopathic Association guidelines for OMT for patients with acute low back pain, and they put them in the National Guidelines Clearinghouse. What does that mean? Well, that means that this is a guideline, and potentially that should be the standard of care for patients with low back pain. Other, ex other examples of use of manipulation for pain, especially in the low back, was this article that was published in January of 2010 in the American Journal of OBGYN. It was randomized, it was placebo controlled, and the outcomes basically showed that it slows or halts deterioration of back specific functioning during the third trimester. Going back to the tenets of osteopathy or osteopathic medicine, we know that structure and function are interrelated and that if you treat the structure, the function improves. But here are some other studies. They're not necessarily about neck pain, back pain, rib pain, you know, stuff that you get on an everyday use by sitting in chairs from 8 a.m. till 11, 11 a.m. and then taking short breaks to get up for coffee or to go to the bathroom or whatever.